When people show up to work, they have a certain level of trust for their employer. Sometimes that's earned and sometimes it's just blind faith. And let's face it, with all that's been going on in the world, today's factory floor has many challenges that didn't exist just a few years ago. Award-winning professional engineer John Pushkar has spent his life trying to prevent fires and explosions at workplaces. Mr. Pushkar is offering this three-part series that spells out, in non-technical terms, hazards that might be found for those that operate or work near gas-fired equipment like bakery ovens, boilers, industrial ovens, or furnaces. The goal of these episodes is to put more knowledge about possible hazards in your hands so that you can have more of a role in protecting yourself at work. Hi there everyone, I'm John Pushkar and I'm here again today to give you some insights into staying safe at work especially if you work around fired equipment, fuels, combustion systems, things that burn things on purpose as a part of manufacturing something or frankly as a part of operating a facility. Layla, this is going to be an important episode because people come to work every day, maybe they've been there for years, and there's certain sights, smells, even the feel of equipment and how it sounds that are very familiar to them. Well, today's episode is going to be about where you come to work and there's something a little bit different. I'm going to clue you in on whether or not those differences are just kind of normal and to be expected or the start of some really big problem that could cost you your life or injure you or others severely. Over the last 40 years, I've developed and led fuels and combustion equipment safety programs for the largest manufacturers in the world. Today, I'm bringing you knowledge, insights, and best practices about fired equipment and natural gas safety. Over the next few minutes, you'll get the kind of practical, real-life explanations that I've become known for. John, I understand that today's topic is all about sights, smells, and even sounds that one can experience when they're around gas-fired equipment at work. So let's start with things that I can see. What should folks be looking for? What might they see that's a problem? Layla, like I talked about in the previous episode, one of the obvious things to watch for is if you happen to see scorch marks, burned paint on the outside of the equipment. And again, this should be part of a pre-startup walk around. If you do, it might be evidence of refractory. The brick cement-like material, sometimes it's a fibrous insulation material that's on the inside of fireboxes to protect the relatively delicate steel that forms the structure of many ovens and furnaces. This would be an indication that something on the inside has been damaged. There's now heat getting through that could melt the outside casing, compromise or warp a structure, could melt wiring that's associated with important safety devices. So this is something to watch for and report right away. The other important thing that you can get visual cues about is how the flame looks. Sometimes you'll have access to how the flame looks. By the way, you should never be watching a light off. When things go bad, oftentimes they go bad when you're starting up there are a number of people who have been injured trying to observe a flame at light off time. So once something's been running, if you happen to see a yellow or orange glow coming from it, unless it's a very specialized burner, that's probably evidence of incomplete combustion, a fuel air ratio problem. There's probably a lot of carbon monoxide being made. I wanna show you a little example clip here where you can just kind of barely make out some of the orange glow from these burners. And then you'll see me making comments about the fact that the carbon monoxide flue gas meter that we have installed here is actually pegged as high as it'll go. If this carbon monoxide were to get into the breathing space where there's workers or into the building, it could cause severe injury and even death in just minutes. What do we have for flue gas? We've buried the CO. 
See how the CO, it, it's, it's, it only reads to 2,000 parts per million. So it's saturated the CO. Besides color, if we do happen to have an opportunity to observe a flame, it should never be driving into or impinging into anything like boiler tubes or the sidewall of an oven or furnace. Burners should be lit consistently all the way around or amongst all of them evenly. There shouldn't be any extinguished spots. Flames should have some good movement to them. They should be blue with some occasional yellow or orange flickers coming off. They shouldn't be lazy, smoky, rolling around, and frankly, they shouldn't have real sharp edges and be real high energy, be very pale blue, and be bouncing all around the place. That's evidence of too lean, too much combustion air. Now, you shouldn't be the one to try to make adjustments. Adjustments of flame should only be made by the most skilled of burner technicians using instruments that analyze the flue gas. But I wanted to at least arm you with a little bit of information so you can ask the right questions and bring these things up to people. My online school has a great module that gives you lots more information about observing flames. It's the Combustion Basics module at the Prescient Technical Services Online School. So what about smells? I would imagine that if you worked, for example, in a bakery, you would at some point be very familiar with the product mix and what's normal and what's not. So the nose and smell can also be indicators of a problem. Not necessarily for a gas leak. You should never be relying on your nose to detect a gas leak. The problem with that is, is that natural gas is mostly methane. Methane has no natural odor to it. Instead, utilities are required by law by the Department of Transportation to inject a certain chemical called mercaptan. And unfortunately, mercaptan has the ability to be absorbed onto new steel pipe. So especially if it's a new project, you may smell nothing and there might be a big gas leak. The other problem is you can become desensitized to mercaptan. So after you're in, a, in an environment where maybe there's a chronic low level of it, after a while you can't discern an additional amount. The other problem is, is that all natural gas products are not odorized. Some folks at chemical plants or large pipeline installations may be experiencing leaks from systems that are not odorized. Likewise, if you work at a sewage treatment plant where there's methane being generated, that methane is not odorized. Gas directly off of wells in rural areas is not necessarily odorized. So again, the nose is not an indicator of gas leaks. You should be using possibly a combustible gas detector, or there's always the old fashioned way. Uh, folks use soap solutions. Many of them use Dawn dishwashing liquid with some glycerin that you could get at almost any drugstore few drops of that as well goes a long way to making the bubbles that come out more profound and easier to recognize. The other respiratory factor that's associated with combustion systems is folks being exposed to carbon monoxide. I talked about this in the earlier segment just a little bit. The problem with carbon monoxide is that it has no naturally occurring odor. It's about the same weight as air, so it'll hang out in the breathing zone unless its temperature is significant, then it'll tend to rise and be a little above the breathing zone. The thing that you might recognize, however, is that when you start to make carbon monoxide from incomplete combustion, oftentimes you're making many other chemical compounds, formaldehydes, alcohols, for example, aldehydes, and those things typically do have an odor. So if you come into work, it's smelling funny, you got headaches, maybe people are slurring their speech, uh, it's time to be concerned. You can get really inexpensive carbon monoxide detectors. Even the home use ones are better than nothing. You have to get people to fresh air right away. Carbon monoxide has a cumulative effect. So day after day after day, that little bit you get adds up until you get to the point where 
You're on the floor hoping someone will find you. Don't be that person. Don't put yourself in that situation. Well, that makes a lot of sense. So what kinds of things should someone be listening for? When burners operate with too little combustion air, I talked about seeing a pale flame. They're often very noisy. Here's a clip from a very noisy burner that's operating with way too much air, not enough fuel. The other type of thing that you might be listening for or hear is when you're starting something up. If it starts with a woomph, that's a delayed ignition. Things should start up in two to three seconds. If they start up at seven, eight, or nine seconds, it's likely going to be audible, and that means you're headed for trouble. Operating with too lean of a fuel-air mixture means the flame is likely to be unstable, which means that it may be pulled off the burner. It may be right on the verge of being extinguished. Now, of course, there's flame detectors which should identify that quickly and shut the fuel valves, but that doesn't always happen. Sometimes, for some reason, something might be compromised or hang the fuel valves open. It's happened before. We never want to rely on one safety device. Most combustion systems are designed such that a couple of things at least need to fail for there to be a disaster. If the flame's unstable, we could be headed for a disaster. Of course, there are safety devices which should identify this, should shut fuel valves, but we never want to tempt fate and rely on everything working exactly correctly when we need it to. John, thank you for this great information. What you talked about makes sense and provides a lot of things for people to be more aware of the next time they're at work. Thank you again, Layla. It's been great to bring this third and final episode of the Safe at Work series. I hope we've provided some really practical, simple things that people can go back with, discuss with their colleagues, and feel like they're kind of better armed to take on another day at work in whatever condition their fired equipment is in that day. Again, if you happen to come across something, you have questions, you feel like people aren't cooperating or your management team needs more information, I'm here to help. Drop me an email, give me a call. Once again, thank you everyone. I hope that you paid attention because at the end of the day, the life that you save, it just might be yours. Hi, it's John Pushkar. I hope you found this episode useful. If you'd like to know about more ways that I can help, you can check out my website at www.prescientts.com. There you'll find information about the Prescient Technical Services Online School, my book, Fuels and Combustion System Safety, What You Don't Know Can Kill You, and also about some of the consulting projects that I've been providing to clients for the past 40 years. Things like implementing inspection and testing programs on a corporate enterprise-wide level, things like reviewing and commenting on capital equipment purchases that involve combustion equipment, and even being a legal expert if things go really wrong. Once again, thank you for attending, and remember, be safe out there. The life you save, it just might be yours.